I don't think we've ever met. Um, and uh, it's such an amazing um, blessing this to, to be able to talk to some of Harold's key collaborators. And um, it's a great privilege. I don't know whether you know, but I, I was um, I met Harold when I was 18 and I joined the cricket club that he was um, uh, chairman of. Yeah, well, that, that was a better way in than any, I would say. <laughs> well, I, I mean. I, it's seriously accepted, I think, as an actress, mm, <laughs> as a cricket player, yes. <laughs> especially as a young cricket player, because um, anyone, I now do the job that Harold was doing when I met him. I'm now chairman of the cricket club, which was Harold's position. So I now know through um, bitter experience that youth and young, new young blood coming into a cricket team is the most important thing of all. So when Harold met me at the age of 18, he didn't really care anything else about me except that I should be available to play cricket. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We, 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 which we, club? Which it's club? Called, it's called Gaieties, the uh, Gaieties Cricket Club. It was the team that he he joined in the mid-60s. Oh, right, and uh, stayed, the, stayed very faithful to. Oh, but, but I mean, it was one of, the, <clears throat> one of the absolute kind of cornerstones of his... Mm. Um, of his existence, he. Yeah, I, mean, I I once gave him as a, as a present um, and uh, um, and a first edition wisdoms. Oh, wow. Well, I well of course I saw those wisdoms often because they he they were in pride of place in his in his study as mm. you probably saw. There are many photographs where where he's surrounded by by wisdom. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I know that Antonia gave them to her son Orlando, who who Harold and Harold was Im immensely fond of. So they live on in the Fraser Pinter um, family. Very good. It's good. It's good. It's Very good. These continuities are are, are important. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and also know, knowing um, the uh, the priorities of his life. <laughs> and I think you know. I think that's right. I think that's what what's wonderful for. A, a great writer to have a, a, a passion that's something very other. Yes, it's a, it's a counterbalance, isn't it? Uh, it, it? It is, and um, cricket has that mysterious mythological kind of quality to it, which which means that once you're hooked, you it never lets you go. And um, well, I, I well, and I have to say that that, that I'm absolutely um, I'm at the end of the of the hook because I didn't understand cricket at all until I had a son who fell in love with it from the moment he started to play it at the age of eight. And then you learn it from the ground up um, because you're watching, you're alongside him learning it. And I just fell passionately in love with it. And so I'm a massive cricket supporter. Did Harold know that? I think he probably, let me think about this. Um, by the no, by the time Alexander was into it, probably I may have mentioned it to him. I may have I may have mentioned it, but I mean it wasn't. By the time that really came into full flood, you know, Harold was um, was was not not well. Mm. Mm. So but, so um, the, the, Our lives were not touching so often. Those wisdoms must have delighted him. And what was his re reaction? Oh, he was he was thrilled. It was it was a birthday. I remember that it was a birthday. Um, when he uh, very sweetly said, you know, he wanted me to join them for dinner. Wonderful. And I uh, thought, so what, what on earth do you give Harold Pinter? So I went to this, I found this specialist bookseller. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I have done a, a tiny bit of research. Obviously, I know about betrayal and I know about betrayal on the radio as well. And I know about in uh, in the heat of the day. I haven't. I don't think I found you appearing in any of Harold's plays on stage. Is that am I am I right? Um, I did well. I did the birthday party when I was first uh, in the first year. I was out of drama school. I was um, where was that at, at the Gateway Theatre in Chester? It was in in the repertory season. So I played Lulu in the birthday party, which I probably was not very suited to. Um, what did you and, make? Of, uh, you remember? Uh, sorry. What did you make of the play? Do you remember? Oh, I remember being fascinated by it. I thought it was extraordinary. But but the most significant thing, and no names, no pack drill, but the director we had made us sit around a, a table for an entire week. And this was three weekly rep. You know, we didn't really have a week to spare. And um, he made us read the line. And then where it said beat, we'd have to 
do a beat like that before we moved on. And when it said pause, we had to give three beats like this. And I thought, this is sort of, this this is um, not really... I, I mean, I just thought, oh, well, this is the world, this is the world of Pinter, but I, I don't know, I was very confused by it, and I don't think it helped at all because it wasn't contextualised. And then years later, when I was doing Betrayal, I, I said to, I told Harold the story, and he said, what a load of nonsense. He said that those beats and pauses are just there to be what happens in everyday life. And I said, well, that's right. They're supposed to inform you about, you know, which we know. I mean, I've, I've, I've never, heard, I've never actually talked to an actor who, who had one of those directors, but I have, obviously, I've, I've heard of, of such a thing, particularly in America, where I think people they, they, they get the wrong end. But I've never heard of it, of it happening. Completely uh, the wrong end of the story. I've never talked to anyone who's actually experienced that, and, and therefore knows it firsthand that it, that it strangles the, the life, mm. it, the life yeah. itself. Out of well, it. and it, it, it's when well, it strangles the life, but it's also not doing what it's intended to do. No, no, it's a misunderstanding. Um, listen to your author you know how does the author think what is it and because he he is so poetic I mean he is a poetic dramatist and his obviously his um his text is so finely curated and so carefully um then just see them as that it's just informing you it's mm. you, what does it tell you a great a great deal it tells you far more than the words do uh, and I'm stating the obvious here but no, no, but that's good. I, I mean, I think these these principles, which apply to everything that we do, but 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 with, with a poet dramatist, I think they are especially acute, and they are they need they bear re repeating, they bear repetition, because so many young people come to them and say, I, I I've been told this is different, but I I I, I need a key to unlock it. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you know those of us who've had more experience than others resist stating the obvious. It's actually. It's actually important to, to to state the obvious. Yes. I mean, Harold did it. On, I made a, a documentary for with him for Channel Four, um, not that long before he died. But he actually went, I think, out of his way on camera to say, when I act in my own plays and I come across a pause or a silence, I sometimes find I don't know what I meant by it, and in those cases, I cut them. And he said that on camera. And about a week later, no names, no pack drill, a very well-known Harold Pinter director went into print in the Sunday Times and said, Harold's got it wrong. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's it's very difficult, isn't it? When a writer becomes very distinguished and, and a particular director or school of directors have got hold of him or her, they like so they know better. They like to think that they that they can tell the they world how it, how it should be. But he contradict actually contradicted Harold. <laughs> well, but it's that it's that reverential approach that is the last thing that he ever wanted. I mean, his his slight surrealism is is based on realism. Yeah. I mean, you know, look look around, look at look at life. People completely unconsciously come out with some extraordinary things, and that was his. His amazing perception was to, was to listen, soak in, and hear just the the, the natural discourse of of daily life, but put in a a, a really sublimely elevated um, mm. text, uh, or, um, or, or sub sublimely surreal. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. And took it, but because but because it's rooted in reality, then you can you can go on the tangent with him. Well, Alan Akebourne told a wonderful story. He he was the second ever Stanley in the birthday party in 1958 in Scarborough was, when, was when Harold was invited by Stephen Joseph to direct it there. Uh, Stephen Joseph said, well, if they got it wrong in London, why don't you come and do it the way it should be done in Scarborough? Yeah. But yeah. They, the, the cast were so baffled by the play that they took him to a they took Harold to a pub in the first week of rehearsal to pump him for answers to what the play meant. But before they could have their conversation, a, a man ran into the pub and locked onto Harold immediately and told the most outlandish story about having, I'm not joking, stuffed his mother-in-law mother up the chimney where she was now stuck because she'd stolen his pay packet. And Harold counselled this man in front of the, the whole group, said, well, I think you should go and pull her out of the chimney because you don't want to swing for her. You know, it was, it was still hanging for, for murder and so on. So the man ran out. And then there was this long silence, Aikman tells the story, uh, after which someone said to Harold, what an extraordinary chap. And Harold said, was he? <laughs> <laughs> as if, oh. as if these people always ran up to Harold to tell them yeah. their, their insane and bizarre yeah. stories, which I think they did. Yeah. I think he attracted yeah. 
people yeah. with, with surreal experiences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And let's face it, it's it's there. We don't yeah. it's not always in front of us, it's behind closed doors, but he he had a an insight into that world. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um so you, you played Lulu, but have I missed anything else? Um I did a, a charity um uh, which Harold directed actually, uh, and I'm trying to think what we did it for. Um, but oh goodness me, it's the it's the one with the interloper in the marriage. Um, oh, isn't this terrible? Collection. We did it. the collection. Sorry, the collection. No, it wasn't the collection. Oh, you mean uh, old times? You mean old, old times? Old times. I, I think it probably was old times. Yes. With Gambon, oh. um, myself and Gambon. I can't remember the other person. Um, so yes, that that was the other thing that we that I've done with him in the theatre. Um, and then on radio, we did Betrayal on radio, which he in which he played um, one of the characters with with Gambon playing. I think Gambon was playing Robert or Jerry. I can't remember which way around it was. It's the other way around. Harold played. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Yes. So you know, you you know. I, I have a recording. <laughs> I, I listened. I've I listened to it many times. Um, it's to have to have that alongside the film. I think is is extraordinary because um, every every reading of betrayal is different. Everyone has their own idea about what's going on in betrayal. And yeah. Harold, being Harold, he invites so much of the of the actor's experience and humanity to come in and meet the, mm. what's on the page. Yeah. Mm. And it, it means that betrayal. Well, you know better than I that. It, although I have played Jerry, but uh, it's like a a diamond. You turn it and turn it, and, and it mm. never looks the same twice. Yeah. And it, it, if you if you land anywhere near the centre of it, it never fails to to tear the audience apart. Well, it should mm. anyway. Mm. I think so. Tell me because I would love to to hear how how you came to. Obviously. You 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 didn't play it in the theatre when it when it opened, but but you played Emma in the in the film, which must have been, I should imagine, um, a, 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 a major career high point to work with David Jones and Sam well, of course, Eagle and of course it was it, it, it was and and the funny thing was how it, how it happened that um, and I have reported this um, before, but but Sam Spiegel. Um, producer, as you know, who was a man of mighty um, history. Um, what he, he loved his lady friends and, um, and he knew the actress Carol Drinkwater. They'd been friends for a number of years. And when he was in London, he was setting this film up. And uh, he said to her, um, I think, because it, 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 originally it was it discussed that Meryl Streep was going to do it. And then Meryl pulled out of it because she and Jeremy had been doing the French Lieutenant's Woman together, which, of course, Harold scripted. And um, I think that she thought it wasn't a very because because things got shoved on. It was all to do with, you know, with the, with the PA strike, Brideshead being delayed and da 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 da. And um, she thought that it, that it wouldn't be good to do two films with Jeremy, one after the other, not because she didn't work, want to work with Jeremy, but because... Um, and so she pulled out from it. And um, uh, so Carol tells the story that she, well, in fact, uh, Sam Spiegel told me that they were having lunch and he said, um, he said, I've got to find somebody to play Emma. And she said, well, why don't you, you know, why are you looking to America? You should have an English actress in it. And he said, there are no English actresses that can do comedy. <laughs> and she said, what a load of nonsense, Sam. What about... And for some reason, she pulled my name out. And he said, I've never heard of her. Who is she? So he, he, she said, look, anyway, so the next thing I got was, a, and I was um, doing a musical in Chichester. I mean, it couldn't be anything more different from Betrayal, but I was doing this musical about the Mitford girls and Mitford sisters. And um, I got this call saying, Sam Spiegel wants to meet you. And um, so we, we met, and for whatever reason, he... he um, he thought I'd be right. And then he asked me to, and Harold, I met with Harold. I had to come back from Chichester for an evening and I had to sit in the super study, which he always called it, the one at the end of the garden, and uh, go through a lot of scenes with him. And um, and that's how it came about. Um, Is that your first meeting with Harold? Yes, it was, yeah. 
Wow. And I had to sit one on one. And but he was he was love. I mean, he was so lovely with actors. Mm. Uh, you know, I you didn't care. I mean, I wouldn't have cared if he tore me apart because I knew underneath it all, he absolutely loved the theatre and actors and working with them. And that was his, you know, that was his default position. So he'd only ever have tried to get the better out. Now, I think he was incredibly respectful. You know, he wouldn't necessarily think that he knew better than you. He just waited to see what you brought to it, as you said. Mm. So after you read some of the scenes with Harold, you then found out, did he... St- I mean, I, well, I, no, no. They, he went back and told told Sam he thought it'd be right. And then the next thing was that the two of them came down to Chichester to watch me jumping around and singing and dancing and playing the ukulele in this in this musical. And then they took me for dinner. And I thought, there's nothing in this show that's going to tell them that I can do the film of betrayal. But right. anyway, they seemed to they seemed to have bought into it. So that was my good fortune. Um, and very um, notable thing about them I mean, links into what you were just saying um that there was a memory because harold did um stay well no there were two things actually i'll say to you the first one is um which you may have heard from elsewhere but mike nichols was originally going to direct the movie mm. you know all that i'd heard that yeah and and mike um was was made to watch this um, television film which harold had scripted called languish go down which Jeremy was in, in order, because in order, I mean, Sam was there, Mike Nichols, because Harold thought that Jer- Jeremy would be right for playing Jerry. And um, so they watched the, the film together. And at the end of it, Mike Nichols turned around and said, um, I'm the wrong person to direct. You should have the man that directed this film should okay. direct Betrayal. Wow. He, he gave, he really did. And David Jones had directed Langrish Go Down. And um, and they were all astonished. He said, "No, really." He said that he, he's done a masterpiece with this piece of work, and he's he would understand it more than I do. So he handed it over, and that's why David Jones did it. Meant much to everybody's. Um, I mean, not that you know, I'd have crossed continents to work with Mike Nichols, but David was a wonderful, wonderful director. Wonderful. Had, had you worked with David already? In this no. Episode? No, not at all. I didn't know David, but um, no, I didn't know him until we did week because we did a week's pre-rehearsal on the show. Um, I I think I may have had to meet up with him before even we started rehearsal, but it was not in any kind of um, assessment situation. I think that Harold and Sam had decided on that. Actually, the way you've told the story, David David doesn't feature in this casting process, which is quite interesting. Well, not that I remember, but it, but, but look, he may. I it, there may have been other things. I don't know. I I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm slightly misrepresented. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I don't know what was going on behind the scenes anyway. And then um, then the other significant thing was Harold left us pretty much alone when we were filming. Mm-hmm. He did not interfere. But there was a day that he turned up on set, and it was the day before we were going to film the scene which ends up as the last scene of the film when Jerry declares his love. And of course, he's got that great long speech. And he was really tussling with it and working on it and so on. We were in the makeup room and Harold popped his head round the door just as as Jeremy was going, "I, I don't understand this speech. What the hell is this about? And so on. And Harold just happened to pop his head around the door at that moment and said, um, anything I can help with, Jeremy? So Jeremy said, yes, come in here and tell me what the, uh, this speech is, is about. And Harold just said, oh, don't ask me, Jeremy. I've no idea. And walked out, closed the door. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I read... Sorry, go on. No, no, I think that's... Um, it's it, it's not necessary because he did know, but I think that I think that you know we're like like a lot of you know there's a subliminal sense in the way they write. They, they just clearly poured out of him, and he, he didn't want to examine it too closely. And I I think he trusted, you know, of course he trusted Jeremy yes. so much to deliver it, which indeed he did. I just you reminded me only that that I remember reading somewhere that um, well it must have been Joan Bakewell who who was telling about how 
she and Harold had had really kind of become magnetized at a, at a party and and they'd gone out onto the street because there was nowhere to talk and and to listen to one another indoors. So they went outside and Harold then produced something of the kind of uh, yeah. of intensity as Jerry's final speech. Yeah. And, and Jane Bakewell just said, uh, you, you know, one, one was not in, in any position to resist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do think, I mean, look, I'm not a critic, but but I think that the performances, yours and and um, Jeremy's, uh, Jerry and Emma, are supremely believable in the film. And um, believability well, well, is so important in Pinter, and and so so naturalistically, the the playing is is of just of an incredibly high quality. I'm not present. well. That, that's no, but that's that's the third major thing that I have to say to you that. Um, that David, when he came on board, and again, David, tell me this, when he came on board with the film, he turned around and said to Sam, we should film this on location because they were going to film it all at, at Twickenham Studios. Mm -hmm. Like it was a, you know, it was a staged, it was a filmed version of a, of a stage production. Mm -hmm. And um, and Sam was was very alarmed. And, and um, I think Harold was to a degree. And Harold said... Uh, don't you know he said don't you think it'll be too real and David said that's exactly my point wow that's exactly my point right this is what it should be it is and that was David's great genius that he put the whole thing on location mm. the only things we did in the studio were the the Venice scenes because we uh, they flew um Ben to Venice just to do the look on the balcony over the canal but it would have been impossible. It would have been too noisy for the intensity of that particular scene. Mm. How do you, what do you remember about, you said you had a week's rehearsal, which doesn't sound to me uh, like a lot. Um, well, it, 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 it's, it's a lot in terms still, of what you get these days. Yes, for, indeed. But but for, for learning and, and then finding, I mean, just before we came on, I watched, I rewatched the first scene, which, Having played Jerry, I think is one of the hardest scenes to you know and and rewarding uh, to play. But it ferociously infinite detail, and there are so many choices. And um, I suppose what I'm saying is, would you say that you were still trusting in the to to play in the moment in different takes and to find new things, or or had you arrived with David and Jeremy at a at a fundamentally agreed reading of that first scene and how to play it moment to moment. There are some very interesting line readings in it. I mean, there's some fascinating reactions. For example, when, when he says, um, Ned must be five, your line, Emma's line is... Um, yes, I suppose you, you must. You, you remember. Oh, you remember, that's right, yeah. But, but in most productions, it's played as, as a sort of, almost a sort of sentiment, oh, you remember that, how lovely, but you play it as... You bloody well should remember that, mate. And then he says, "Yeah, yeah, I do. Of course, I remember." You, you slightly, you. Uh, I say, you, re you remember. Yes, you That's do. You, you pin, yeah. you slightly pin him, and it yeah. immediately takes any sentiment out of it. It, it brings in a lot more of the, of the difficulty and, um, and the hinterland of, of the affair. So I'm just curious as to how, how the, the three of you, um, came to such. Um, I you wish do, I could you do the scene I wish again. I give you. I wish we were talking, having this conversation a month after we'd filmed. Um, but what I do know is that in that week, we uh, we it was really about um, getting to know each other and seeing where we were coming from. Things, but David David steered it as well. Um, he he was wonderful at giving very gentle little nudges here and there, and we'd also we discuss it. Um, I, I mean, I remember one day we were in the Kilburn flat and um, it was one of the meetings between Emma and Jerry and um, there was a line, I got, I got your letter, because it's when she'd come back from Venice and when uh, he has to say, I got your letter, which people would, the instinct would be just to be informative about it. I got your letter. But... Jeremy, being wonderfully inventive, was playing around and he went, I got your letter. Ooh. <laughs> um, and put a, put a, I mean, we were playing, playing around, but I remember Jeremy coming up with that. Mm, mm. What a racy letter. <laughs> um, that, 
the wonderful thing you see. That's because it is so spare. There's so many choices you can make. Yeah. Yes. Well, it certainly remains uh, completely watchable, and it sort of belongs as a film in a in a you know a really noble tradition, or almost disappeared now, of films about middle class life and about mm. relationships, and you know, think of mm. um, Saturday Night Sunday Morning or um, you know the Joe Losey films, Accident that, mm. that Harold did, or, or well, of course, yeah. And funnily enough, I was. Um that we never met at this point. When I was a drama student, I um, I looked after Joe Losey's children. Oh. I was a sort of summertime nanny mm -hmm. to um, to his to his well to his certainly to his son Josh. Oh, so God. I mean there was there were you know there were tie ups there. But um, I was going to say yes. The the other thing is when we did the Heat of the Day. Uh, the producer it was a passionate Elizabeth Bowen fan. And um, she said to me, I want Harold to do this, which was a kind of stroke of genius again. Uh, but she wasn't at all sure that he would agree. And he pinged back within three hours, I think. Yes, 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 because he loved Elizabeth Bowen as well. Mm. But he said to her, the only thing is, if I do it, it'll be me it won't be Bowen, it'll be my words. And she said, but that's the point, is the distillation, you know, mm. because she gave the richness. Um, and you, you, you can't, you have to condense down anyway. So he was, this is why he was a brilliant uh, screenwriter, because of that ability to distill. I was doing a bit of homework a couple of hours ago and I, um, discovered that Harold had read Elizabeth Bowen, well, that novel, In the Heat of the Day, at the age of 19. Yeah. Um, so um, just, uh, you know, more more uh, evidence of his forwardness as a as a consumer of, of literature, as a, as a very precocious yeah. young man. But but clearly he, he and with L.P. Hartley, too, and the go between, he was coming yeah. back to books that had meant an awful lot to him. And uh, I think that excited him greatly to, to be allowed to play with a, uh, an original to, to make a screenplay from a, a novel that he had personally been very very moved by it. And those those books are all dominated with uh, sort of almost shady human passion, aren't they? It's it's human passion that's almost dark in its intensity. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, I think that you know was a, a, an attractive theme to him. Well, talking of which, I, I, if you don't mind, I must ask because it's. In, when when actors come to rehearse portrayal in, in, in the theatre, it always comes up, as it must. There is a reference where Robert says, oh, you know, I've given her the odd whack, um, oh, yeah. which he refers to as the old itch, which these days is, is a, you know, problematic line in any play. Yeah. Um, but in David's, uh, Harold's screenplay and David's version, you and um, Robert have a preamble before anyone said a line of dialogue in which the audience sees you being struck. Being hit, yeah. What do, do you remember anything about reading that and thinking um, anything about, or was there a conversation in which that that came because you all talked about it together, or was that Harold's decision and there it was on the script? It would have been David's decision, I think, to, or maybe, maybe, I mean, Dave, I would imagine that David had that conversation with Harold and said, I'd like to see this actually happening. But of course, the, again, the, the clever thing was you saw it through a window. Mm -hmm. So you were of wire looking at it. You yes. weren't seeing it full, full bloodedly. But you know, one has to remember how much Harold admired Noel Coward mm -hmm. and how there is a line in private lives which, funnily enough, I'm supposed to be doing at this minute, except it's been delayed. Um, and uh, it, the line is, women should be struck regularly, like gongs. <laughs> yes. Try saying um, that now. Well, quite. Um, but then, even worse, and immediately after you've been struck, the child walks in. Yeah. And that actually catches one's in one's throat. 
and and Emma turns and and tries belatedly to protect the child from the energy of the of the room. It's incredibly telling. Mm. And yet there are no there are no words. And as you say, it's done through through a glass darkly. But there's unmistakable violence. Mm. I mean, yes, she hit him, but um, you know. Yeah, but but I think it's a it's a, a Wyndham, as you said, it's it's that study of the um, of middle class British behaviour that on the surface all seems so perfect and well presented, and there was something much more disturbing going on underneath mm. and do you how do you or did you but do you now because emma is must be alive in you somewhere how do you feel about her how do you feel about her and, and what she what she did and what she um what she chose what she sacrificed yeah I think, uh, what do I think? I think that it's something that was happening everywhere and people just weren't, it just wasn't being exposed. Mm. That's what I think. Uh, and that was then. Um, we're much more open about things now, but uh, I, think it was a, I think it was a tale of our times. I think it has socially great importance. Mm. historic importance I mean um, I don't um, I haven't do, do, do you know what I haven't seen the film for as long as I can remember uh, and I haven't read it and I haven't been to see another production of it <laughs> and you didn't see the production before you did the film no no that's a I wonderful didn't. that's a great which is probably which is probably a good thing it's a great way to come to a play like Betrayal without any baggage at all. I think that's that's almost. Well, otherwise, you feel you have to replicate. You feel somehow that that's been. And of course, it was. You know, it was a, a very notable production, mm. um, and uh, was an anchor of, of the um, of the history of the play. Uh, and you'd probably have. I might well have felt. Oh well, I need to keep on those tram lines. So coming at it from another direction was, and I think for, for that reason, you know, every, every, as you say, everybody brings something different to it. But m maybe I'm, I, the reason I haven't seen it is um, probably that uh, we did what we did and you don't want to see, it, 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 it's, I think it's just not occurred to me to want to see another interpretation. Though I have no problem, I mean, of course, you know, it's a, mm. it's mm. A, a real go-to. I mean, it's one of the, they're, they're just doing it again, aren't they, in Bath? They're doing it in Bath now, and they, and, yeah, um, with wonderful Nancy Carroll, who, and I, they did it on, uh, they did it on in the West End and on Broadway not long yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things. I, sorry. That, they did a very different. Um, they did a very different take on that, didn't they? They made it very sort of much more. Um, yes. What they did, I mean, one of the things that has, is now happening to Harold is that people do, particularly directors, I suppose, they come to the plays and they've seen three or four productions and a director can be seduced into thinking that they've got to do their own take on it rather than do the play. Yeah. As, you know, I, I, I'm not going to critique anybody, but but um, that that production was extremely spare, Spartan, yeah. I would yeah. say. I mean, a, ch yeah. a couple of chairs... Yeah, um, but no okay. furniture, no attempt to create naturalistic spaces or psychological spaces in which a believable affairs would take place in a flat in Kilburn. No attempt at all. It it worked for the most part extremely well because the text is simply so impeccable strong. and yeah. strong that the actors can, as long as the actors can bring that sense of of life yeah. off stage. Um, yeah. Then, then an awful lot of things that one would think must be there don't need to be there. It is, yeah, it is. yeah. But it's a version, isn't it? It's a version. It's a but it, you know, it came very close. I felt to being a bit of a take on the play, uh, but I, I, in some ways, I find I'm very traditional and quite like to have enough of a of a psychological set, to, so that I, I I can just as, as an audience member, I can fully surrender and say, okay, I buy where we are. Take me on your 
take me on the journey. Um, but it, but as I say, it was it was very very interesting to see it done with nothing and a tiny bit of projection maybe. Um, and there've been productions where there's been a whole Super Apes home movie of the child being thrown up and down in the kitchen, and you know directors directors have a field day if they've got a bit of a budget, don't they? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's you know what we come back to that it's um, it, it shows the uh, the quality of the play um, that it can take all those different being being put in different directions and still survive. Uh, it, it's um, it, it's a very very perfect piece of writing. Just one other thing about betrayal. Well, I'd love to ask you because I mean it relates to everything we've we've already been talking about, but it does working with young people, particularly young actors, it does come up again and again, that they they feel they urgently want to create a, a lot of backstory um, for, for these characters who, who are ambiguous and in Harold's world always bring a tremendous sense of mystery coming from the past into the, the present. And I just wonder what your feeling is about, maybe with Emma particularly, but, but generally about whether it's important. As a, do you as an actor like to have quite a comprehensive backstory going um, for yourself. I mean, for example, in the, that wonderful opening shot of Betrayal across the building site and then towards the pub. And as we go in the pub, Emma's there waiting. Um, now, it, it, But Jeremy's at the bar. And actually, that is what happens in the play as well. But there's there's a lot of information in the shot of Emma waiting. That, that, that tells us a great deal. Because um, we immediately, the audience immediately think, what, what is she thinking? Um, has she has she been to bed? You know, how, what's her state of being? So I'm, uh, you know, actors love to to kind of figure out what what the character had for for breakfast and all the rest of it. Um, I think I think you can weigh things down too much. I think I think you can overthink things. Um, I I think by all means do whatever level of research you feel that you need to do, and people have different um, different ways of doing that and. And so on. Um, but I think if you overcomplicate too much, um, then you 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 don't know which. I think you've got to have very simple. After all, when people live in the moment, they live in the moment. Um, I think you you the, just to know the energy that you're bringing into the room at any moment, or what what, what you're carrying. But but you can't you can't bring all you can't bring a life. Uh, me talking to you now. I'm not bringing you my whole life. We're just, you know, we're just on a, a narrow tra trajectory mm. about one particular thing. Um, and I think the actor brings the weight of their own their own life, which is enough, really. Mm. That's my feeling. But yeah. again, it depends. It depends from text to text. There are some that would require that much more. So, with a screenplay like Harold's, where where everything is complete, it's finished. Everything is wrought, poetically complete. Where is where where is the actor's power? Where it, the, the lines aren't up for grabs. You're you're not going to get to 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 just have an idea and go. Oh, can we put this in? Which you know many many actors are very good at and clever at. But where does your your power lie as an actor when when everything is is has been essentially done done already? Then your power is in exactly what your choices with every line with every exchange what which way are you going to go with it are you you know uh, there's there's a myriad of different things and that's that that is what is so extraordinary many writers there's only one way to go mm. um and you work that out you, again it comes it happens with the dynamic between you and uh, and the other two actors and how the, the, the different weights that you're playing. And uh, yes, the dynamic is probably the best way to describe it. You can't, you can't do a wry take on something if, that, if the other character is not going to catch that you're being or, it, it, you, you know, these are just things that come out in the, in the unfolding of the playing. And that's why a, a week's rehearsal was, was very good to sort of see how we could stretch, and also I think just to see the fundamentals of what each scene was about, because David knew that once we got on set, then you looking at a lot of different people's time. Yeah, you can't just have the crew no staring at the ceiling while you decide how you're going to play it. You've got you've got to get your your yeah ducks in you a row. Have a reasonable idea. Yeah, 
And oh. also, I think David took us through where, how and where he was going to shoot each scene and the way he was thinking of it and, and so on. And it, it also comes, it's simple storytelling. You know, that's, at the end of the day, what we all do. Mm. And I feel that our, our overriding remit is, is to tell the story as the author intended it. Mm. The, 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 the scene for me in the film of Betrayal where David's storytelling is is most um, direct, I think, is the Torcello scene. Um, because the camera movement tracks. I mean, you are so stationary. Emma is, whoever plays Emma, and it, it, it is, is going to find the Torcello scene um, very immobile. And uh, Robert gets to wander, and David's camera really cuts between you monitoring his movement and him observing the still point in his turning world. And something happens, which I, I, I have often shown to young actors, and that is to do with your breathing, with Emma's breathing. And I don't know whether whether you remember this at all um, or how consciously I you do. did it, um, but I, I've watched it and thought to myself, I believe Patricia Hodge has used her breathing here quite consciously as a way of storytelling Emma's emotional, the state of her being. You have no, there are many places where Emma has no lines. You simply have to, to receive the, 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 the information that Robert, uh, he might know. Oh shit! I think he does know. Oh, she's in blind panic. She's in blind panic. She's in blind panic, and you're, there's a there's a particular shot which stays on you long enough for the audience to see a breath coming in and coming in and coming in and coming in. It's the most wonderful because uh, I, you know, I talk to young actors about breathing all the time and about. Mm. Um, so I just wonder whether you whether you remember being conscious of that. But it's wonderful. It's brilliantly done. I, 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 well, funnily enough, it's the thing that Harold remarked on when he'd seen the rushes. So it's oh, funny that you're talking about it. Really? Yeah. He noticed that. He came to me, I think, the next day and he said, you're breathing. Um, and it was not me saying I'm going to, it was, it was not me saying I'm going to do big, deep breaths. Oh, no. It was because I was in blind panic in mm. the in the scene. And that's what, you know, that, that's what happened. So I let it, I let it happen and inform the scene. And you see, Ben's a wonderfully intense actor. He's he can be wonderfully frightening, and uh, there, there was a tremendous energy coming from him as well. Um, and you'd kind of know from the beginning that he, again, because he gave the character that sort of slightly jokey thing as well. So it's the joke before Vesuvius blows. He's warming up to it. And you see, there, there's another example of a piece of invention that Harold allows you to do. Um, do you remember the line when he's talking about, uh, oh, there was a, the, these Italians or something, so free and easy? Um, just because he said there was a, he picked up a letter for me at the post restaurant. And, um, and that's where the panic starts. And he remains incredibly kind of jokey and these Italians so free and easy. And he has to say, I have a good mind to write to the Doge of Venice about it. Do you remember that? And he goes, good mind to write to the Doge of Venice about it. Yes. <laughs> Yells it out through the, you're only through the yards, open window into the canal. 100 yards from the palace. <laughs> That's yeah. brilliant. And what about the moment where the, um, I mean, going back to the, to the violence, but there is that extraordinary moment where he, he lifts a hand and then, Brushes a hair from your forehead. Was that was that planned, or did that happen in in the moment? I wonder. Um, I, I can't answer that. No, I can't answer it. I would imagine that was possibly something that David and he worked out together. There's a cut to a. Because um, I don't yes, don't I finish you, something? You, you, yeah, I mean you're bringing it all back to me. I have to say, <laughs> yeah. That's... Look, all I can tell you is it, it bears. Very different for you, I understand, but it it bears multiple viewings. It, it um... well, um, that's that's wonderful that that you that you think that. When you came, to, what do you remember? Very, uh, Sorry, no, no. Were you going to say? No, I, I, it was you know it, it was one of the privileges of my life, I think, to work with him, to work with Harold. Well, I was only going to go on to 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 ask about 
coming revisiting it in the in the radio studio because then to play it with Harold um, must have been like a kind of uh, like Christmas coming all, all over again. I mean, um, do, what do you remember about being in the studio with Harold and, and Michael? Gale? Well, did he behaved like an actor in the studio? I mean, he was always full of bonhomie and uh, and uh, of course Michael knew it very well, having done it in the theatre. Um, so it was a, it was an interesting combination that because it was the it was the theatre meets the film meets author, Maybe. but he became because again you know he he was an actor um, by formation, and uh, and that that he didn't try you know he didn't get in in the way of it at all he left um, Ned Shia to direct it. We had some good lunches I seem to remember, <laughs> <laughs> liked a good lunch. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But you don't think anything much changed in in the way you approached Emma for the for the radio? No, I don't think so. I think I think we kept. Uh, we may have we may have different you know, again different dynamic. But I would imagine that I, I kept Emma in a re- reasonably the same ballpark. I mean, I didn't start reinventing her mm-hmm. and there was probably it was quite a few years in it, it was nine or ten years in between it was nine years I think yeah in between the two things and um, I wonder whether, whether it was before or after you had worked with Michael on um, on the Elizabeth Bowen on Heat of the Day uh, it was Probably are. Uh, it was no. I did Heat of the Day before I did the radio. Oh. A betrayal. Yeah. They don't make films the anymore. Heat of the like, Day we did in 1988. They don't make films like Heat of the Day anymore, do they? No, they don't. They don't. Because there's an um, amazing amount of love in in the in the the detail, the period, and getting all that right. Oh. The costumes uh, are extraordinary. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's and it was tragic that it was put out I think on New Year's Eve or something um, in the days when ITV and BBC were fighting each other all the time and um, it was I think they thought it was a major film they put it out on a major day Mm. but of course it was a day when nobody was watching television unless you were you know Jules Holland's Hogmanay or something (laughs) Amazing. Um, I mean, it brought together a, a number of key people in Harold's uh, life. Peggy Ashcroft's in it. Yeah. Mar- Christopher Moran was a, was a Pinter veteran. Um, Michael York had had appeared in Accident, and um, that's right. And you uh, having done Betrayal, so it was, it was almost like a sort of first eleven of Harold's <laughs> ideal um, film film uh, company. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lovely thing to work on, and uh, there are just little snippets there that I um, that I remember of real Haroldism, like um, after the funeral, the very very early on. And have you seen that film lately? Very early on, um, there's the funeral scene when me as a divorcee um, is sort of kept away from everybody, and then he cuts to the two ladies in the uh, I'm in the in the ladies' cloakroom. The two ladies were here having a little treat. Are you having a nice little treat? <laughs> Stony. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but just that giving weight to a word like treat mm. that you you wouldn't necessarily use in that context. But there is something in the very simplicity of it. It, you know, it takes me back to the birthday party and when, um, uh, oh God, what's what's her name? Um, I want to say Doris Hare. She played it originally. Meg. Um, Meg. When when Meg talks about those flakes, those <laughs> lovely flakes, <laughs> that it it has an extraordinary. It gives weight to the to the commonplace. That's really what I'm trying to say. Yes, that's the poet's 
a poet's gift. I mean, we were doing a scene from uh, The Lover yesterday, and at one point the word plump appears, and Harold, fall, he falls in love so much with the word plump that he has it repeated about eight or nine times in one page. Mm. And every yes. time someone says plump, it suddenly takes on, it somehow becomes saucier and saucier and, and yes. gets more meaning as it goes on. Absolutely. And it would, would and it, it's, it's visceral, isn't it? These words are somehow, yeah. and they're just, Gorgeous, gorgeous for actors to use. In fact, there is a word that that, that Meg reacts to. What is what's the word? He's oh succulent. That's it. She, oh he, succulent. He says yes. you're a succulent old old bag or something, and she says, "Oh, you mustn't <laughs> use that word." <laughs> <laughs> what word? Succulent. <laughs> um, yeah. I've suddenly, I've suddenly remembered a question I wanted to ask you about betrayal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, we're coming. We're very much coming to the end, but I've suddenly remembered I wanted to ask you why. Do you think Emma doesn't tell Jerry in the pub that Robert's known for years? Why do you think she maintains that she only told him last night about their affair? She had the chance to 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 be honest with Jerry, and she doesn't she doesn't take it. I, I honestly, I'd have to go back to the play again. I mean, my instinct tells me that she didn't want, because as soon as somebody knows something, particularly something with that level of importance, it changes their behavior. I think she didn't want to change the behavior. You mean to have that much impact on Jerry? Mm. Well, as it is, he, he, the, by the end of the scene, he he is completely discombobulated, isn't he? By well, the there end. you are. So that's that. That's the point. But she's been measuring that rather than dropping the entire bomb on him. Mm. What, what? I think. I think honestly, I would really have to go back to it. Oh, I, I know. mean, maybe it's. it's I, I'm, but that that's sort of from what I remember I think that's probably what what was felt but um but again you know it, it's it's a play called betrayal <laughs> it people betray each other on so many different levels mm. and uh, what he's actually saying is that people are you know dishonest they're dishonest with each other and, and with themselves um mm. but the heat of the day is very much about that isn't it I mean the position the, these things must they, they, obviously these things fascinated Harold. I mean, he, I think he said somewhere that that for him, the the fact of the Holocaust was an un. Uh, it informed everything he thought about in some in mm. some way. Mm. Uh, the, the 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 sheer scale of the betrayal of, of the German people. Um, but in but in the heat of the day, uh, your character is invited to betray her lover with a spy who is in turn going to betray his country having told you that your lover is also betraying his country i mean mm. this is this is this is yeah, um, I a, a maze of betrayal yeah. kind of yeah it is it's, it's thematically it's thematically not di not much different harold must have found these these human quandaries mm -hmm irresistibly um, because they reveal so much about what, what human beings are, are capable of. In their, and in you their see, when, it, it, when he would have read that, so he was 19, what, I'm trying to think how old, but what year that would have been? Would have been 1949, the same year that he that stood, stood trial twice that year for conscientious objection and was prepared to go to prison because he would not betray his values. There you are. So it was very, very fundamentally important. And only three years or four years after the war had ended. So yeah. it was um it was very much of the moment. I think that's exactly um right. mar marvelous, marvelous, marvelous man. I I really I, I you know, I, I think to have even um met him once would be a, a privilege but you know this was and we we did I, I knew him and I also worked with Antonia so you know I knew them 
socially very well. And he was um, he was heaven with women, <laughs> absolute heaven. And that goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't mean I don't mean in any lascivious sense. I mean absolutely that he just he just respected women so much and understood them, mm -hmm. understood female, and that's a you know wonderful and rare thing mm -hmm. to to get female roles that, um, that that have the layering and the the insight into female emotion that that he was able to give. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so well, that's beautifully said. I don't know that we can say much more after that. No. Uh, it's been really delightful to talk to you, Patricia. And I know that some of the things that we've talked about will help other people, young actors and um, people who are interested in understanding and trying to get into that 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 depth, but feel that sometimes the, the outside forbids it. Uh, it's so wonderful to um, to share that with you, and um, thank you. No, not at all. I mean, and, and again, the, the overriding thing I would say, and very particularly as we've been talking about in terms of Harold, is, is always, look, always look for the, the, author's, the author's voice. The, what's, the author, what's the author's perspective? Which, what is the way they heard that line being said? Um, and it, it, it simplifies things. If one can get to that, you know, if you can unwrap that, and see, then it stops you laying it with laying something on it that actually is going to lead you into too complicated a, a place. Mm. Well, um, that's the whole the whole the whole quandary of acting is is how to get out of the way. But one one usually has to get out of the way by by trying to lay stuff on it, and then realizing that actually it's almost more about taking taking oneself out of the equation, out of it, and just just being the being the vessel. But that's the road, of, the road of exploration, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and sometimes I hope, easier than other times. <laughs> well, I hope your production of um, of Private Lives. Uh, well, we'll be we'll be the oldest couple ever to do Private Lives. Um, <laughs> and I I did think it was um, I, I thought it was a, a a joke when I was asked to do it, and uh, the director said, "Just read it, just read it." But I said, "It's ridiculous." I'm afraid. Um, and I read it, and of course, you know, again, you're totally sedu seduced by it. And I realised that 95% of it is not age specific. Mm -hmm. Again, it's great writing. You see, you can. It is. It is about two people that can't live together and can't live apart. Mm -hmm. And actually, what age they are doesn't matter because. And it might. I just thought, you know, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting, even if we fall flat on our faces. Uh, it's. It's a challenge I want to take up. Well, just. Look after each other in the fight scene. That's all. <laughs> yes, we'll we'll do that. Yes, that's got that's got to be. Um, I, I mean, two two something year olds fighting is a bit different from two thirty one year olds. But we're, anyway, we'll we'll find a way. So lovely to talk to you. Ah, thank you. Most grateful and really no, to meet you. Thank you, and and good luck with it all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye for now. <laughs>